Hello, forensic science students. I am Mr. Williams, and today we are going to discuss chromatography applications in forensic science. Chromatography is a fun unit, and basically, it is a way that you can separate mixtures into individual components. It can be very low tech, or it can be very high tech. It can be as simple as separating ink on a paper towel all the way through using complex multi-million dollar instruments to achieve the separation of chemical mixtures. So in general, what is chromatography? Well, chromatography comes from the Greek word chromos, and that means color. And it's a collective term for a family of laboratory techniques for the separation of mixtures. Chromatography's purpose is to separate mixtures. So it involves passing a mixture which contains the analyte through a stationary phase which separates it from other molecules in the mixture and allows it to be isolated. All right, so what does that mean? So you, you got this solution, all right? In your solution, you have the solute, the thing being dissolved, and the solution, the thing doing the dissolving. And so you are going to pass this through some kind of substance that it, it um, will absorb in, and as it travels through this substance, whether it's ink traveling through a paper towel or whether it is a mixture of chemicals that's passed through some very fine sand particles, uh, we'll call it silica. Um, eventually, as it travels, the different chemicals, they travel at different rates and then they separate. And so chromatography is the physical separation of a mixture into its individual components. Very useful in chemistry, and it's how you purify compounds. So we can use chromatography to separate the pigments of inks and dyes, such as those found in pens, markers, clothing, and even candy shells, M&Ms, Skittles, all that kind of stuff. Chromatography can be used to separate the colored pigments in plants or be used to determine the chemical composition of many substances. In here, we have a um, image where somebody was taking a maple leaf and that maple leaf was used, um, or actually they were taking maple leaves at different times of the year, um, blended them up into like a little you know, leaf tea and then they put them on paper and then they let the paper um, soak in it. And as it travels up, um, as actually as water travels up, they'll, they'll put the um, ink on the paper and let water travel through the ink. But as the water travels up, it separates into individual components. And in this picture, you can see how there are different components throughout the uh, months of September and October. Um, you can still see this uh, yellow line all the way across. We're going to have our um, chlorophylls and carotenes. All right, let's see if I can switch this slide. There it goes. All right. Now, different types of chromatography. So one example would be liquid chromatography. So liquid chromatography is used to separate substances and other compounds for identification or isolation. And so I used to do this a lot in the laboratory, the organic chemistry laboratory in my first career. And so I'd take a, a mixture of chemicals dissolved in some kind of liquid, and I would pour it down this glass tube. Well, this glass tube had an open bottom, and um, the glass tube was filled up with this special kind of sand called silica. And so as um, I poured this liquid through the column, um, the silica would prevent some of the molecules from traveling as fast as others. So you keep on pouring fresh, clean solvent on top, and as you keep doing that, as you keep doing that, you will um, end up with um, a separated mixture as you go down. And then, um, and for example, in, in the picture you see here, the sample has different colors. 
And so you can easily just like collect the different colors of the chemicals, right? Sometimes chemicals are invisible and you can't see them. You might have to use a UV light or um, some other method to um, determine that you've collected them, but it's really useful. Um, it's very profitable to do that. And yeah. Okay, next one is thin layer chromatography. And so basically you use this thin piece of plastic. It's got a glass tray, sometimes a, a, a thin piece of metal is used. And then they um, kind of cake on the silica gel, the silica gel. Um, the silica gel is the same kind of silica that's in the um, liquid chromatography glass tube. But they just put it in this uh, little flat surface. And on the bottom, on this bottom line where these uh, – or this line is right here, you would have placed right here uh, that chemical at each of these locations, make three little columns, and then you would have placed this plate standing upright in a solution. Um, and so this solution, you would put it below that um, black line that you placed the chemicals on and as the um, thin layer plate moves up excuse me as the um, solvent moves up the thin layer plate the different components will separate and we can see that we have um, separation of components here we could identify that this component here if you're looking at my mouse right and this component right here appear to be the same component because they travel the same distance. Not because they're the same color. I use the same color to um, make it a little bit more visually identifiable. And then we have paper chromatography. This is what we would use in the laboratory. And we would take some, some uh, Crayola markers, compare them with maybe some dollar store markers, and we would compare the color black. And, um, often, the color black is a mixture of many different um, colors to get that dark color. Well, um, it could be useful to separate that. Um, maybe somebody is forging or altering a document, and you can tell what kind of pen that it came from. Well, here, um, paper chromatography can be used to separate components of inks, different dyes, plant compounds like the chlorophyll and the, the maple leaf that we saw. It could be makeup, uh, other substances. Um, it's very cheap to do this. And, um, and so if you're using a substance that this can be done, it's a good thing. Now, gas chromatography. Gas chromatography is very interesting. Instead of using, um, instead of using um, paper, you're using a, um, a vapor, you're using a gas vapor. And it's often used to determine the chemical composition of an unknown substance. Like I have a substance, what is it? Let's put it through the gas chromatography machine. And um, it's used for, so like the different compounds in gasoline, for example, would be shown by each separate peak in the graph below. And um, so if I put in gasoline, um, as time goes on, the different components would dissolve at different times. And, um, you know, you are heating up the, the substance as well. And depending on the um, vaporization points and the solubility of that compound in whatever gas you're using, you will get different peaks. Okay. <clears throat> and so let's just talk about the difference between mixtures and compounds. So mixtures are two or more substances that are mixed together, but not chemically combined, right? You could have a bowl. In the bowl, you could put um, sugar and salt and mix them together, right? Um, that is a mixture. Even if you dissolved it in water, um, you have salt and water mixed together, right? They're not one substance. Any, they're not one substance. They're two substances just dissolved. So examples of mixture is air. The air we breathe is a mixture of gases. It's mostly nitrogen, about 16% oxygen, uh, and some other um, compounds in there as well. 
A bowl of cereal is a mixture of cereal and milk. Soda pop is a mixture of soda syrup, usually high fructose corn syrup, water, CO2 gas. Fog is a um, suspension of water in the air. Kool-Aid is a mixture of water, sugar, and flavor crystals. It's basically flavor, water, sugar, and flavor crystals are mostly just citric acid. It's just flavored lemonade, guys. Compounds are different. Compound is a substance formed when two or more elements are chemically bonded together to form a molecule. So you got salt. Salt is chemically bonded sodium and chloride, and they're combined chemically to be one substance. Water is hydrogen and oxygen combined chemically. Carbon dioxide is carbon and oxygen combined chemically. And they have unique properties to themselves, and you can't separate salt from salt, right? If you do, you've undergone a chemical reaction to separate sodium and chlorine. And so um, you cannot physically separate these materials. And chromatography uses a physical change in the physical properties to get them to behave that way so they can be separated. Solutions are mixtures in which one substance is dissolved in another. A solution is going to have two parts. You have the solvent and you Excuse me, you have the solute and you have the solvent. The solute is the substance that is being dissolved. Okay, you got Kool-Aid powder and you're dissolving it in water. The solute is the Kool-Aid powder. The solvent is the substance that does the dissolving. So if you're making Kool-Aid, water is doing the dissolving. And so here, um, identify the solute and solvent in each solution. So. Um, in lemonade, right, we have um, your lemon juice and you have water, right? And you have your lemon mix. Let's say you're using a powder mix and you have water. What's the solute? Well, the solute is going, going to be um, the solute is going to be the lemon crystals, the powder mix, and the solvent is going to be water. And soda pop, we just talked about it. Um, you're going to have your soda syrup and your sugar. Uh, and your other flavorings, and the solvent is going to be water. And ocean water, you're going to have lots of salt, and the solvent is going to be water. And so there's this um, measure of how much a substance will dissolve in a liquid, right? And we call that solubility. If a substance does not dissolve in water, for example, we would call it insoluble in water. If a substance if a substance does dissolve in water, it is called soluble. Salt, for example, dissolves in water. So salt is soluble in water. Um, let's say uh, bricks, right? Bricks that you build a house with. Bricks do not dissolve in water, so it is insoluble in water. Wood is insoluble in water. Wood does not dissolve in water. Um, so there are um, yeah, some examples of that. So how do we use chromatography in forensics? Forensic scientists use chromatography to determine if drugs obtained from a crime scene are pure or contain fillers. Pure samples suggest it may be from the original drug supplier. So the more pure and the more high quality a drug is, it, it, you're usually closer to that original supplier. Adulterated samples, the stuff that's been cut with other substances, suggest lower level dealers. And as uh, drugs get sold and resold and resold and broken down into smaller quantities, um, Drug dealers who don't care about you, they only care about money, they're going to start putting other things in the drugs, whether it's going to be baby formula or inositol, or they will put, you know, they could put chalk or salt or they put all kinds of crazy things to make their small amount of drug appear to be larger so they can make more money. It's terrible. Um, Inks can be examined to identify altered documents. So let's say I wrote a check to the bank and it was for a thousand dollars and but um, somebody wrote over the check, they wrote the word 10 and made the 1,000 look like a one zero thousand, ten thousand dollars 
Well, um, likely they would, there would be different pins used. And if they use different pins, you could use chromatography to, to determine that different pins, which will have different inks, which have different chemical compositions, are, <clears throat> are contained on that document. And you could prove that um, multiple pins were used, which would suggest that the document had been altered. Okay, so there is this um, mathematical ratio. Don't get scared with that word. We call it the retention value. Sometimes it's called the RF value. And it's the value that measures the movement of the sample from its original location in relation to the movement of the solvent. So um, the final location that the solvent traveled is at the top. Let's go from the bottom, actually. That's going to that's help out a little bit more. Okay, so this um, rectangle represents, let's say, a piece of paper. Um, you would draw a line with a pencil, because pencil is insoluble in, in uh, solvents. You would um, draw a line with a pencil, and then you would take a, you would put a bit of the sample of whatever you're testing on the paper. So you just dot that right there, okay? And then at this point, there wouldn't be any other dots on here. There wouldn't be any other lines. So you would put it in a beaker. And so you put it in a beaker and it's got a little bit of water. And the water level needs to be below this line as water travels up. Um, the sample, the chemical that you're using, would travel up. And um, if it is not a pure sample, you'd have multiple dots traveling up. Okay. And then wherever that water line stops, you would take the pencil and you would draw that line across. And so um, this is, would help you calculate something called the retention value. And the retention value just, um, each substance has its own retention value on how far it would travel on, um, on the chromatography paper or whatever chromatography method you're using. And so since we, we can identify that it travels that far, we can calculate the retention value. So the original sample location is at the bottom. You just draw a line there and you, you put your sample right here. Okay. Um, this should, the distance that the sample traveled, well, the sample, it started here, but it traveled all the way up to here to its final location, right? And so there's, there's the dot. The distance that the solvent, right, if we were using water, it'd be the water, that the water moved would be all the way up to this line, okay? And so we would draw that line right there. Okay, now we can calculate the RF value for this um, material. So the RF equals the distance spot moved divided by the distance the solvent moved, okay? And, um, you should always end up with a number less than one because the sample is not going to move further than the solvent. And so if you did that, you just get a value and you can identify that, hey, Crayola black markers contain an ink with a RF value of this much. And then you can use it to, to identify Crayola ink markers. Okay, and there's that blown up again. Um, won't go over it again. Sample right here with the pencil line travels all the way up to here. Solvent line is at the top and you just take the distance spot traveled divided by the distance the, um, the water traveled. And um, yeah, you will have the RF value. So let me show you an example of this. <clears throat> and so you get this little, hold on a second. Let me handle my dog. All right. So in this example, what we have is, um, So what we have is um, 
we got our baseline. That's where we drew that pencil line. And we put a, um, a dot right there where the, the ink or the chemical is. All right, and then um, we allow it to, to run its course. And what we need to do is we need to measure all these distances, okay? Okay, and so um, we are going to measure from where the sample originally was. That's why we put the line there all the way up to here. And let's say it was four centimeters. And then we measure from the baseline all the way up to the, um, the top of where the solvent went. And that was five and a half centimeters. 4.0 divided by 5.5 equals 0 0.7. Okay, and there, is, there are no units for this. It's just 0 0.7. It's a RF factor, it's a ratio, but that's how you calculate it. That's kind of like the um, uh, real useful. If you take college chemistry and you do chemistry labs, you will be calculating the RF factor. Good stuff. Okay, so we're not gonna be able to do that activity. So guys, um, that is my introduction to chromatography. Um, I this is going to be the um, last week that I post new content. Next week, I think it's going to be a little bit of getting people caught up and maybe some um, last minute um, activities to try to get these grades um, boosted. You're going to have to work for it, though. Thank you for watching, guys. Have a great day. Please come to live class and be ready to ask questions. Thank you. Bye.